Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast. I'm your host, Todd Kasky. On the Second Bite Podcast, we get a wonderful opportunity to interview uh, CEOs and entrepreneurs that um, have built successful businesses and in often cases uh, have sold those for seven to eight figures and are, and are working on the Second Bite. Uh, we have a series called Going It Alone, where we've got a few entrepreneurs that have have not taken private equity money, have not been acquired by a strategic uh, and, and with some very good reasons for that. Today, I have Alex Porter with us from Location 3, who will be telling us his story of going it alone. Alex, super happy to have you on our podcast today. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here. Excited to chat today. Excellent. You know, I, what I found, Alex, people really love the podcast because we have the opportunity to talk to entrepreneurs and CEOs that are, I'll call them undiscovered or people have never heard of, right? They don't launch themselves into space and they're not in Forbes <laughs> magazine, but they've really accomplished something I think is very impressive, which is to build a real business and add real value to their to their clients. So I'm thankful for you to be on. I'm also thankful for our sponsor, which is the good people at EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And EOS um, is, is uh, you know, I used to think it was one of the best secrets uh, in the entrepreneurial circles until uh, I, I kept bumping into them over and over and over again. I've had many clients tell me that EOS Worldwide has saved their business, saved their marriage, saved their life in, in, in a couple respects. So for any of the listeners that have not uh, familiarize themselves with EOS, I would suggest you go check them out there at EOS Worldwide. we got a b- bunch of materials that will help support entrepreneurs to get the maximum out of their business. So great folks over there at EOS Worldwide, happy to have them as our partner on the podcast. Uh, so Alex, let us jump into our conversation today. You are CEO of Location 3. Tell us a little bit about Location three and the people that you serve and what you do for them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so location three is fundamentally a digital marketing agency, but with some pretty specific differences. Um, we've been around for over, I guess, about over 20 years at this point, um, which is pretty unusual in the digital marketing space. Um, we started out, if I can, if I can give you the, the quick, quick history. Do. Yeah, yeah. We, we started out, Andrew Beckman, our founder and current chairman, he uh, started the company in the late 1990s. He was he had come off of starting a, a number of international sales offices for DoubleClick um, and saw the opportunity in uh, basically a, a media arbitrage uh, game. So he started the company. I came on board a few years later, um, met met. Total by chance at a, at a concert in downtown Denver. We had both gone to the University of Maryland, Maryland, go ter- Terrapins, yeah. um, and basically said, hey, um, I've got this thing going on. Internet's going to be big. Why don't you come join us and, and see what happens? So, um, you know, at the time, I mean, this is 1999, Google didn't even exist. Um, Yahoo was the main game in town, although it was called Overture at the time. Um, fast forward a few years and we decided to try out Google. Google showed up to our office and brought some lava lamps and said, hey, you should try out this Google platform. We think we've got a good thing going here. And uh, lo and behold, I spent the next few months on my computer moving bids up and down by a nickel on certain keywords and got some pretty amazing performance out of it uh, and decided to go all in on the, on the search world. Um, and then over the years, is just an evolution and, and we really shifted as the industry shifted. So really becoming a full service digital marketing agency, uh, which means that we focus on your paid, your earned, your owned assets, um, and ultimately driving performance. Uh, everything that we do is about uh, beating ROI expectations for your marketing. You know, we take great pride in our partnerships with the marketing teams and, and can feel that we have an influence on our partner's bottom line. And then about four or five years ago, 
um, we were kind of faced with a, who are we? What do we want to be kind of question? Um, we were a, an agency that was catering to, to really any, any vertical um, and it had made it hard to really differentiate and kind of understand where our focus was. And we looked at our, our client base and saw that our best clients, our longest term clients, our, and also our, our best margin clients were all in the franchise space. Um, and they were we franchisors or franchisees? Both, both. So we had we had developed some programs, uh, really just by from from a lot of people hours, um, and it was a it was a complicated process, but we had we had gotten a, a pretty good um, handle on it, uh, which was which was pretty funny because a couple of years before that we had sat there and said, should we completely get out of the franchise space because our message wasn't resonating. We were going to the IFA, the International Franchise Association annual show and trying to tell our story. And most of the franchise systems just weren't ready for digital. They weren't interested in what we were having to offer. Um, I think it was the, that as, a, as an industry, they were a couple of years behind just where everyone else was. But we, we held on and all of a sudden it was it had the, the, the switch flipped and what we were saying was resonating really, really well. So we decided to go all in on the franchise space. So currently we focus on uh, about 80% of our revenue is in the franchise world. And it's a pretty interesting um, philosophy and approach that we have. So our, our, our mission statement is to provide enterprise level strategy with local market activation. And what that means in the real world is that we're working with the corporate marketing team, the enterprise marketing team, the national ad fund is a, is often called at a franchise where we're doing, you know, the data and analytics and the organic optimization and the listings optimization and any kind of national paid media buy. So we're, we're working with them on that enterprise level, but then we've built a platform and a whole kind of really basically a second business. Um, and that platform is called local act. And that is the franchisee solution. So right now it's a software with a service. We have data connections back and forth to any any and every marketing platform you could imagine, Google, Facebook, um, and on and on and on. Um, and we pull the data in from the programs and report to the franchisee on performance. And then we also leverage all the various technologies to manage the programs in a very effective and efficient way on the other end. So if you can imagine Right, you have 500 franchisees. Each franchisee has an average budget of $700 across Google, Facebook, Google Display, YouTube, um, on and on and on and on. It's very, it's a very complicated process to manage. Even just to manage the budget across across those is a very, very technologically challenging. But to do it in a way that that drives performance um, is, is our sweet spot. And, and that's really what we pride ourselves on is we feel that Local Act as a platform and Location 3 as a company is responsible in many ways for driving the success of these franchisees, which are ultimately an SMB and make up uh, the franchisee world makes up about half of all small businesses in the United States currently. Um, and so we're really proud of that fact. We 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 work with these people on the one on one basis, and we feel the impact when they come back to us and say, "Hey, my sales are up. My phone won't won't start ringing. How do we do more? I'm having my best month ever, my best best quarter ever." Um, especially over the last year and a half, it's 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 really gratifying to feel the impact of our programs. So, so a lot of your a lot of your clients are small businesses. But you have this layer of complexity because there's a, com a, a compliance of sorts with the, the mothership, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. Like on, on the website, you reference like Mountain Mike's Pizza and Fast Signs and, and people mm -hmm. like that. So so they can't have their franchisees making wild claims that aren't true in their marketing message. So you have, you have to sell to a large enterprise, but also serve a, a, an SMB. Yeah. So the way that we operate is we find that that relationship at the enterprise level, the CMO level, the VP of marketing is crucial for the success of the program for a lot of those reasons. We need to make sure that brand guidelines are in place. Territory targeting is in place. There's consistent messaging, but also that data flow 
by collecting data across all 250 mountain bikes locations. And um, I love that you shout them out. They are, if you've never had mountain bikes pizza before, they're primarily in California. They are amazing and they are just growing like gangbusters. And it's because the product is so incredible. Um, but that's one that we've been working with for the past couple of years. And before we worked with them, it, they, they didn't have a lot of digital marketing. Um, and so we put these programs in place. One of the things I need to, to, to mention too is our partnerships. So with Mountain Mike's Pizza specifically, we've partnered very closely with Google to help Mountain Mike's transform into the digital marketing program that we're at. We hosted, Google hosted us and their regional marketing folks at their, at their headquarters out in California and had an all day training session about what is digital marketing? What is Google? How do we make this work? Um, so it's it's a real collective effort to to drive these results. Um, and because, but we're working, we have to work at both layers, right, to make that information work. And and so because of your experience and history, you have access to things at Google that I don't, that agent that that uh, customers may not, that the guys at Magic Mike couldn't. Can you talk about that for just a minute? Mountain mics, mountain mics. <laughs> Jeez, what did I say? Magic mics. It's a whole, whole, it's a whole different. That's Get a whole off the different. movie. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not mics. Yeah. yeah. So we we we've been having we've had a very close relationship with Google for going on 15 years. Where we're currently a Google Premier partner, um, and what that means is that first of all, we spend a lot of money with Google. We send them a lot of checks every month, but we're also at the forefront of adopting. Um, their tools and technologies. I think we're actually coming out with a white paper here where it showcases that we're one of the, the best agencies in the world in terms of adopting their um, their platform. Um, sorry, I'm getting an echo on mine. Are you hearing that? Or is that just me? No, no. no? It's, okay. It's I'll, just, I'll just ignore it. Um, so yeah, they have an immense toolkit on their back end that helps optimize budgets and spend levels and with all the rules and regulations around privacies and cookies and retargeting um, by getting first crack at those things is has been a, a pretty amazing. And you have a direct dial into something oh, yeah. that make sure you're always well taken yeah. care of. As you're In the last few years, years, the last few years, we've actually, Google's actually hosted us and our clients at, a, at an annual summit out of the, the Googleplex out there where we have a couple full days of content where their leaders in analytics and media and organic um, kind of present to us and our partners and, and really get the, the cutting edge information around what's what's going on at Google. So, oh, that's a nice differentiator. Um, yes. So a couple of things. So first of all, help me get location three, uh, understand the this roughly the size of the business. Can you give me a, a measure there? Revenue, employees, something of that nature? Yeah. So we are um 2021, 20, we should do just under 10 million in revenue. Um it's about a 10%, 10 to 15% growth year over year. Um and if we look back on two years, it's about 15% um going back to 2019 as well. So we've we've had a, a really nice growth rate um, and the majority of that growth is in the location side. So we've added, I think, 3,000 locations into the platform over the last few years. Wow. Um, and uh, from a people standpoint, we're uh, just right around 70 folks. Um, two years ago, they were 99% all in Denver. And then today, I think they're about 50% in Denver and 50% uh, you know, we have folks in South America. We've got uh, we've got folks all over uh, now. I mean, what a, what a change in the work environment over the yeah, last. Yeah, for for, for sure, and I'm I'm sure that's posed some of your uh, your own challenges. And just to you know, to clarify, the 10 million of revenue you're talking about it is not including the money you send to your friends at Google. It's net no, revenue. No, in terms of media managed, I think we manage around 50, 50 to sixty million in in media. Per year that we're, that we're paying out. <laughs> yep. And so let me uh, so wind back. I want to just pick up on on your comment. You said it was a few years ago, and we asked ourselves the question: You know, who are we? What are we doing? I find that that question is always driven by some type of event or pain point or frustration. 
Yeah. Can you take me back to what caused you guys to ask that question and then come up with the answer you did? Two, two things, really. So one was we, our largest client at the time, um, and it was, it was really, I've heard it be called an anchor client. Um, it was making up close to 40% of our revenue at the time. Um, and they, uh, they unexpectedly and quickly went out of business. They were in the kind of the for-profit college space, and it was not something that kind of enjoyed at once we kind of heard some of the stories that were coming out of that. Um, and so that was a big, that was a big game changer for us. We lost a lot of revenue. We had to really look at what we were doing, what we were focusing on. Um, and then the other thing was just going to some of these trade shows, standing up in front of your booth and having people walk by and being like, okay, I've talked to eight people that do what you do. What makes you different? And I was sitting there. I was like, I don't have a really good answer to that question. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and it didn't sit well with me. I was, we, I was like, we have to be like the best at something. I want to be the best at something. And I want to have that clear vision of what we're trying to do. And that, that really is our, our vision right now. We want to be the best digital solution in the franchise space. That's our goal right now. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of technologies that are kind of around the space, but there's still to this day, aren't that many folks that are focused on the franchise world. And one of the reasons is it's hard. It's, it's not easy to work with, you know, 8,000 locations that are franchisees that essentially each one of them is, is a CMO of their right little kingdom. Yeah. Right? And that's, and like I mentioned earlier, I mean, this is, this is not, um, you know, a PL sheet for a giant corporation. This is, are they going to be, how are they going to pay for their kids' college? What are they doing for their retirement? Like it's, this is real, real dollars and cents here. Sure is. The, um, so today we're in the summer of 21. Your largest client is no longer 40%, I assume. Largest client is, is what for you percentage wise? Um, we've done a really good job of diversifying. Um, and I think that that's because of the space that we're in, um, our large client right now is probably about, about 18%. That's great. The, uh, um, and you have 3000 locations on the platform. That's just, that's additional over the last year. So we, right now we're around 8,000 locations in the platform. Wow. I would imagine that makes the business very sticky with those friend with those customers. Yeah, I mean, I, I the the mantra that that I preach over and over again is your number one job is performance for these franchisees, right? If we are driving them clients, if we're making them profitable, um, it, it's it's a very hard platform to turn off, right? There's 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 Makes very sense. there's very little reason to turn something off that that you that you know because we're completely transparent in everything we do. You log into the platform, you see. You know, the keywords that are getting bought, you see everything and anything about what your program is doing. Um, so there's there's no there's no kind of hidden bells and whistles. It's all right there in front of you. So, yeah, the, the stickiness is is great. And we're obviously very concerned with churn, looking at churn. The, the, most of the time, the churn that we get is if the business itself is is not doing well. So obviously. During the last 18 months, there were some businesses that just did not, uh, could not service their, their brands, their sure. clients. And then there are other ones that just exploded. One of, the, the, one of the best success stories I've seen over the last 12 months is a franchise we work with called Wild Birds Unlimited. So they have around 350 locations and they primarily sell bird feeders and bird seed and things like that. And uh, it makes sense, right? What are what are people doing? They're sitting around yeah, out the window, <laughs> right? They, they put they get these great bird feeders out there, and um, you know that was that's another brand that two years ago or so they weren't doing much digitally, um, and we've grown them. We we run a pilot proof concept, and now they have you know I think all 350 locations are on the platform buying media, and they're seeing results, and they've they've had record record years. I like to think that we're part of that. I think the environment had a big part of it, but we're certainly helping that along the way. But that's, that's, sure. those, those are stories that I just love so, being involved in. Yeah. So you've got, 
70 employees ish half of them are scattered to places that you know the the new world has allowed them to yet you continue to be one of the best places to work in in Denver specifically in Colorado and, and so forth how how do you make that work and and have you had to make changes to accommodate the mobility for your for your employees yeah i mean when when all this started happening um you know that was one of our biggest concerns was how do we how do we maintain our culture right our culture is very much it's focused on performance um and for our clients but part of that is we have to be innovative we have to be collaborative but we also want to make it enjoyable, right? If you're spending so much time at work and with these other folks, um, I'm a big believer of your happy employees make for happy clients, right? If they're if they're feeling good. So, I mean, we did all the things that I think everyone else did. We tried to do the virtual happy hours. We did virtual trivia. We did, um, you know, a buddy system where we would pair people up. We had um, more frequent kind of all hands meetings. Um, but we really, uh, one of the things we really doubled down on was kind of the training of our folks and ongoing training and sharing of information. So really leveraging, you know, the Microsoft teams platform to make sure that we were sharing information, having ongoing communication. Um, cause I think what I missed personally the most was that kind of that water cooler moment where, you're sitting there, hey, did you read this article about whatever? What do you think about this? Um, and instead, now it's a lot of getting email bombarding and messages like that. So it was, it was how do we how do we kind of keep this communication flow going? And we've done a pretty good job. And I think that the the best places to work, accolades and things that we've done in the past is really about us valuing our team. I mean, I don't think it's it's any great secret, but I'm a very, very big on having good EQ and making sure that our, our managers are trained on how to effectively manage people and understand that everyone's a little bit different. And, um, it, you know, it, it pays off in the long run if you really value your people. Um, and I think one of the big things that we saw over the last year is we had to, we had to increase the amount we paid people. Um, as people, as the world opened up and you could work anywhere. We were now competing against maybe a New York firm that could pay 30, 40, 50% more than we were paying in Denver. So we really had to take a hard look at who were who and what we were paying and and make some some significant adjustments there. I think, you know, probably year over year our average salary is up 30% just wow. um because of that factor. And how how is that I know you continue to grow, but how does that impact your your margin? Well, it definitely doesn't help them. <laughs> um, or, you know, it's 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 one of those things where it's it's kind of you know it's basically inflation for the salary uh, for for talent. Um, this digital marketing talent is is in such high demand. Um, I, I mean, I practically I want to st- start a little digital marketing school on the side and just get people certified and get them out there because it's it's hard to find people. Um, right. There's a real talent war going on right now, and um, we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of in-house folks wanting to build teams in-house instead of using agencies. We're seeing these bigger agencies being able to pay a lot more salary. So it's definitely hurt margin, and ultimately what it's done is it's passed along. I think that we're seeing fees go up um, from other agencies, and um, so that it's it's... It's costing the clients more. It's costing us more, but it's still a very positive return. So we're not at a point where people are like, I'm not going to pay that much because I'm not getting the return out of it. But um, it's certainly, there's certainly a cascading effect with that. Yeah. And but so, part, I'm sorry. But part of what we also had to do was figure out how to leverage technology more and more to automate as many things that could be automated, right? So we don't, we want our team to be focused on client strategy and data analysis and understanding the you know, multimedia attribution modeling and coming up with new ways to do the media and not, you know, just oversimplify it, pressing a button a thousand times a day. So how do we limit some of the high hour tasks? Um, so that's one of the ways that we've really mitigated that, that kind of increased salary and, and margin problem. 
Yeah, it makes sense. When you think about, so you're roughly 10-ish million of revenue this year. When you think about growing to 15 or $20 million, what do you, what do you see as the biggest challenges to, to, to growing the agency? Um, I think it's, that's a great question. So our model is get more franchisors in, so the top level, and then add to the bottom on the franchisees. So for both of those things, it's just, it's just that, that sales machine and getting people in the right spot and getting the right message and getting them onboarded. Um, so I think in one respect, it's just volume and it's the people um, putting the, the kind of the pedal to the metal and, and getting them engaged. Um, I think we're seeing a, an appetite for change now. So I, we're, all of a sudden we're flooded with interest and in, in people that want to come on board. Um, so I, I see a, a, I, we, we have a very nice kind of forecast and projection to be able to get there over the next really 12 to 18 months. And really on the franchisee side, that's a huge opportunity for us to um, grow that. So we have 8,000 locations and, you know, only a fraction of them are, are on the Google Display Network. How do we get all of them to be on the Google Display Network, right? That's a, that's a quick revenue bump. And that's something that we partner with a Google on. So they say, hey, let's co-host a webinar. We'll push it out to all of your locations, explain to them the importance of top of the funnel. Uh, marketing. And that's that's an area that's, you know, it's challenging with a franchisee who's not a marketer to help them understand the nuances of all these things, right? So spend a couple hundred bucks a month in Google display. And what does that mean? Well, it means that your ad is showing up everywhere that's not on the search engine, right? You're, you're reading the Olympic recap from last night and you see a pizza ad. Um, you know, it's targeted to you in your area. Maybe there's a special offer. Um, they might not necessarily click on that and convert, but the next day they're like, oh, I want pizza. They remember your ad, they're buying the pizza, but that's an educational. Um, yeah, it's a process. For us, right. So um, I think it's, it's, it's really just about a numbers game at this point. And it's also about looking at potential other markets. So are there co-op markets that we should be approaching that might be like an auto dealership or a, um, you know, a buying group for a, a lighting or something along those lines. So there's other pockets for us to to go after um, that we just we just need to go out and execute against, really. Right. And so, as we had talked about uh, at the beginning of our conversation, you know, a lot of these trophies over my shoulder are from either private equity or, or more often uh, companies that are supported by private equity doing acquisitions. I would imagine you have private equity knocking on your door pretty frequently. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a, a stack of emails in my inbox right now for people looking to connect or asking to connect. Um, over the past years, we've chatted with folks um, and, and it, it hadn't, it hasn't been the right time for us. Um, but I think the market is almost pushing us to take interest just because there's a lot of activity in the martech space and a lot of in the local digital space over the past year um and it, it I, I think that i don't we don't want to maybe miss the boat on a, some opportunities to um infuse some capital that would help us from a technology standpoint from a from a sales and go to market standpoint but also with some potential acquisitions of companies that we could bolt on that makes sense that are kind of ancillary to what we do that would help round out our offering. But yes, we've got um, PE world is, is very uh, active right now. Yeah. And, and so I know for guys like you that have, have elected to continue to grow the business on your own are aware of some of the advantage of private equity. And I, I think you just, you know, uh, alliterated some of those, but there's also a message in your head, either from, anecdotal evidence, something you've read or stories you've heard from others that is that has you concerned or at least slowing your role a little bit. What are the things that you worry about most if private equity came in and, and you know, became an investor or perhaps even a majority owner of Location 3? Um, I, for me, I think it's, it's somewhat of the kind of the fear of the unknown, which also makes it exciting. So 
I've, I have some colleagues that have experienced this and gone through it. And, you know, some of the, the, some of the horror stories you hear is, you know, the very big shift in culture and, um, you know, you're, you're, you're no longer in charge of your own destiny in some ways. And I think that that's probably the, the biggest fear. Um, but I, but for us, we, we're, we're able to, as we embark on this journey that we're just now starting, um, you know, I th- what we're looking for is quote unquote, smart money. Somebody that knows the space can really be a, a, a consultant to us. And, and I think that I would assume that that kind of flushes itself out during the process of really tr- finding that fit. Um, and we've got some, some, some nice networks of, of folks that we've kept in touch with throughout the years that we'll be tapping into to help us with, you know, getting in front of the right people and getting some feedback on where we are and what they think. And, um, you know, I think that the, the story we have to tell is, is really compelling. So I'm excited to, to get in front of some folks and tell it and see what comes out of it. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of advice out there about how to grow an agency. Right. And, and you guys have done it, you know, from scratch, bootstrap to where you are today. What do you think are, are the main couple of reasons that that you've been and have enjoyed the level of success that that you have? I think that we off we we take we're playing the long game. I think we've seen over the years people try to take shortcuts in this agency world, especially working with the franchise space. I can't tell you how many years we've gone to the IFA annual show and there'll be a new, new booth pop up that is makes a big splash and and say, Hey, we know, we know franchising, we know this in and out. And the next year they're not there because they maybe realize that it is, it is difficult. So I think it's, it's take that long-term perspective. Don't take shortcuts for, for a quick win. Um, I think, um, you know, be really authentic in, in what you do and, and tell that story well. And then I think it's a lot of it comes down to fair pricing. I, you know, we've, we've had some situations in the past where we may have been charging too much for what we were doing and the, and the value truly wasn't there when we looked in the, in the mirror. Um, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, you know, the digital agency side of the business is not a hockey stick curve growth, I think. Right. You know, you, you, you it's very strategic. It's very consultative where we're seeing that that potential for that exponential growth is on this local platform side. So one of the things that we're thinking about right now is do we separate those two businesses out, really focus on the technology and transition it to a SaaS platform um, and open it up to potentially other markets, to the SMB markets, to licensing it to other agencies. There's a lot of additional opportunities there. Um, and that's one of the things that, as we talk to folks, will be interesting to get that feedback on and, and where do they see um, the, the opportunities for the company as a whole or as the platform right. uniquely. So those yeah. are some those are some questions that I'm, I'm looking to, to get answered. But advice to grow a digital agency, I think um, just enjoy the ride. <laughs> and so let me ask you this then to, to wrap us up uh, as I always end uh, the podcast. So you've been obviously very successful in in your personal life, but also in your business life. Is there anything that you can point to, whether it's a book or a person or an experience that's had a, a, a lasting impact on you that that you think has contributed to your success? That was a that was the the one of the the questions you had sent over for the pre read. I was like, wow, that is a that is a good question. That is a tough one. Um, and the more I thought about it, yeah, I this I don't I don't know. I, don't, I hope this doesn't come off too um, preachy or whatever. But I went to a Jesuit high school, Saint Ignatius Loyola in Baltimore, Maryland, and I think the the education that I got there, the friends that I made along the way, and the mentors that I got during that experience, I, I can really point back to that as as probably one of the times in my life where I was challenged the most. It was incredibly difficult, but it was incredibly rewarding. Um, and just that that message of uh, the St. Ignatius philosophy is to be a man for others. 
Um, and I, I like to think that I, I live with that every day and try to um, ultimately help other people. Um, and it's, it's very rewarding. So I would, I would say that that, that is, is one of my guiding principles um, that I've lived with since then. That's great. You know, I had a, um, I went to St. John's Prep in Danvers, Massachusetts, and uh, Tony Penna was uh, a great uh, example of how to live a, a life for others. Did you yeah. have somebody at St. Ignatius that that made a big impact on you? Um, you know, I it was it was uh, it was just a collection. I think it was the overall experience. Um, you know, my my grandfather went there. I had a lot of uncles that went there and I just really admired um, a lot of qualities about them. And I don't think I knew it at the time, but now looking back on those formative years and really the the lessons learned there were, were very much uh, um, have, have impacted me ongoing. That's great. And Alex, I will say your, your openness in the comments and the things that you shared uh, are helpful to hear. So I want to thank you for spending a little bit of time uh, talking about where you are now and, 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 you know, it'll be fun and exciting to watch the, the business and the agency grow we'll to the first bite. Right. And then I'll come back yeah, on yeah, we'll, for the second bite. <laughs> so we'll have to have you back at every bite. So I will, uh, I'll thank you for this bit of time today. We'll look forward to talking to you again and staying in touch as, as the agency has the success that, that I'm sure you will. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Alex. Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.